Hello. Hi, Dan. Hello, everyone.
Okay. Okay, who do we have? This is me, Michael, Dan, Leona, Nick. We have Lorna. We have Michael, Marv. We have Tyson. Hi, Tyson. Hello. Okay. Um Suppose we wait for another minute and then just get started. I just joined somebody named D. Raw. Um, who's that? Who are you? Hello? Okay. Uh, John, Do John Doe it is then. Right. No. Okay, and he left, he or she left, okay. Good. Um, let's kick this off then. Um, yeah, welcome to the second bi-weekly OpenWhisk um, Tech Exchange. I was appointed to moderate this this time, so here I am. Um, and I, uh, as I put it on the agenda, I wanted to start with uh, a quick round through who's on the call. Ah, uh, now he or she is back. Um, looking at the attendees we have today, uh, I think we have no new face except um, Draw Gensler and Lloyd Roseblade. Okay, here we go. So we have a couple of uh, new people on the call. Um, yeah, I guess uh, we should. Should we, should we start with quickly introducing ourselves, uh, at least to those two again, <clears throat> so we know whom we talk to? Do you want it, Ian? Sorry? Oh, boy. Yeah. So, as I said, uh, Lloyd, if you want to start, yeah. quickly tell us who you are, what you're doing, why you're interested in OpenWhisk? Well, actually, I work for Swift in IBM, and uh, I'm interested in seeing what you guys are doing. Okay, Doc. Uh, next up, um, there was Ian Patridge, but he seems to get lost. Um, someone called Mark. Hey, Mark, I should have used my last name, Mark Duser. Ah, okay. Mark Duser from IBM it is then? Yes. Then we have uh, Draw Gensler. Well, Draw Gensler. Yeah, hi. Um, x developer just started a startup. We start a company relating to serverless compute, big fan of OpenWhisk. So I uh, thought this would be a good uh, opportunity to catch up with what you guys have been doing since I have last looked at the system four months ago. Awesome. Cool. Um, yeah, maybe, may, maybe for the rest, uh, I quickly go, go through everybody. We have a couple of people um, of uh, Adobe on the call, 
namely uh, Tyson, Michael Marth. Um, please ping me up if I, if I forget someone. And we have uh, obviously a couple of people of IBM, which is me, Mark, Nick Mitchell, um, Vadim Raskin, Dan Levine, Michael Berendt, Lionel Villard, and Roderick Rubber. And we have Lorna. Want to say something real quick? Actually, I'm an IBMer as well. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm not an IBMer. Sorry, I wasn't aware of that. Right. So, yeah, to shortcut this a bit, uh, I, I just uh, quickly mentioned all the names so we can get to uh, our topics. Um, lost my own agenda. Here we go. So yeah, I wanted, wanted to quickly start with um, what's new. And at the moment, I, I wrote the topic um, topic entry. I thought, why, why don't we write uh, emails every week containing what's new? <laughs> I think that could be something valuable uh, for the dev list, as uh, people always complain uh, that they want releases and some digest of what's going on. So let, let's do it here for now, and maybe we can, uh, we can agree that we do this on a weekly basis on the dev list. Um, Dan, do you want to say something about the uh, latest cube work? Um, sure. Uh, so for the cube work, um, I know that there is uh, a couple blockers, and we're working on some PRs to try and uh, get some of that stuff in, like um, more configurations built into Docker images themselves, um, all configurable through environment variables. That way we don't have to rely um, as much on Ansible. And I know that the Nginx, or, I'm sorry, the console uh, removal PR went in, which was pretty nice. So that was definitely one of our major issues. And that's been resolved, which is sweet. So that's where we are today. All right, thank you. Um, as for the main repository, um, I started, I think last week, I started deprecation of the old container pool. Um, what old versus new container pool even means. Uh, I put it on the agenda. Um, if people are interested, I can uh, speak a little bit more about this uh, later. Um, but I started the deprecation process, and we are now at a stage that where the new pool is the default, <clears throat> and uh, you need to opt into the old pool. And in I think a week's one or two weeks' time, I'll completely completely remove the old code base to prevent um, confusion because we had a couple of PRs now trying to fix something in the old pool, and we've been saying, uh, yeah. Please fix it in a new pool as well, and or, or only fix it in a new pool. So to, to end this story, um, we into, oh, I've I've started the application of the of the old pool. Uh, besides that, future feature wise, um, I'm obviously probably only aware of of my own features. I, I think PHP was already in the last time we had we had the call. If if not, it's in now. Um, and from my personal point of view, um, I added some admin features for namespace specific uh, limits, which is great for for um, yeah. If you have a hosted version of OpenWhisk and you have a multi-tenant version where you have users paying, uh, you can lift their limits uh, if they ask you to. So that's uh, a feature. A feature is great to use. So it's in now. Anybody else aware of something cool and fancy that we added in the last two weeks? That's a no. Um, we have somebody new on the line, Galaxy S6 Edge. Uh, hi, yeah, this is Kavita uh, from uh, uh, Seoul. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, hi. Yeah, I, I'm just uh, uh, peeking in. Um, I don't have any uh, anything to share at the moment. OK. Uh, have you been in uh, on, on the call two weeks, be uh, two weeks before? 
Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah okay, I remember. I love how uh, how global this call already is. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I've been uh, 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 participating in the other Kubernetes deployment as well. I am a little more uh, you know familiar with that work because I was uh, playing around with Kubernetes. Uh, but obviously, once that wraps up, um, performance issues are something that uh, my team is also uh, looking into here. We just started using it for our local setup. So yeah, I just wanted to see uh, what the general discussions are uh, in the open risk. Uh, yeah, thank you. All right. Cool. Uh, okay, that's it for the what's what's new and cool section then. Um, next section I called out yesterday for or the day before uh, for some topics for the agenda. Um, unfortunately, uh, only Nick uh, raised his hand. But uh, that's not to say that uh, it's unfortunately just Nick. It's to say the number of people raising their hands is too small. But uh, let's go with Nick then, uh, who is going to show us the OpenWhisk shell. OK. Um, Can you grab yeah, so um, please interact as much as you want. Um, I'm going to be sharing on a bigger screen, so I'll be looking away from the video camera for a little bit. But uh, so. Um, the, the, this sort of this work stemmed from a, a bunch of months working with developing some apps using OpenWhisk, and it was using primarily the the Whisk command line, WSK command line, and running a lot of Bash scripts. And uh, I think it's sort of, sort of, sort of I think it's sort of dawning on me, and I think probably others, certainly the people I've talked to, that there's probably something better we can shoot into it. Um, we're all writing shell scripts to um, for handling common cases, that oftentimes the syntax is this very heavy whisk activation list every single time. There's a lot of characters to type when you want to do something quickly. And so we probably all invented shell scripts and just shortened that. So shortening some of the common commands. There's also sort of common sequences that we've probably all embedded into shell scripts just to make those common operations uh, just a little more convenient. Um, and some of those are being incorporated into the WWS command line. Others haven't been yet. For example, give me my last activation. Um, but just beyond sort of the simple stuff, there's sort of a lot of larger picture items that also require shell scripts, even longer shell scripts. For example, um, if you want to create a web page, you can do that now with web with the web action support that we added, I think, a couple months back now, two or four months ago. But you need some shell script wrappers around it to make that actually work. Um, and there's a lot of, lot of items beyond that. For example, I mean, I'm showing some showcase here, I think on the screen right now, creating a periodic trigger, something we all done. Um, the way you do it currently with the CLI is just a little bit cumbersome. Um, not just having to remember the current syntax, but the fact that you have to do, you have to think about feeds and triggers and binding when that's not really what you want to be thinking about as a programmer. I'm speaking personally here and people I've worked with. Uh, and I mentioned your feedback as well. I think the thing I want to think about when I'm creating a periodic trigger is the period and the, the action I want to invoke. Anything beyond that is, is the details that are unimportant for that task. And so the, um, what I'm following with right now is, is a, a command that we've added to the shell via a plugin. And I'll get to the details on um, here if you want to get to that level. You can type every five minutes, do an action. And that's sort of the level that I think I'd like us to be aiming towards. That if there are common tasks that are atomic in that sense, I'm creating a periodic, periodic rule. And I don't want to think about writing a shell script to, to script out the three or four lines it'll take to make that happen. Not to mention all the low-level details that I have to think about to make that happen. Um, we should be shooting towards that those higher level tasks and making those higher level tasks one simple one liners to the extent possible. Um, and uh, sometimes we want to invoke, we want to just do some, some schema liners or projection, projecting that field. And those are, right now you have to create a file for it and that file has to have a name, um, it has to sit somewhere, and you end up with a mountain of little files floating around doing. You know, for a larger project, all doing simple tasks like these projectors or aligners or um, uh, 
data terminators for security. There's a lot of little bits of data manipulation you have to do. And sometimes it's just convenient just to weave those in. Um, it would be nice if you could weave those in um, when they make sense. So for example, I'm shown here, um, an arrow syntax of the shell ends. I'll show you the real life thing in a second. Um, but we can sort of more fluidly weave together components. So in this case, I'm weaving together um, three actions into this three action sequence, two of which, A and C, are pre-existing actions that have already been created. And the middle one, B, I haven't yet, but I just want to weave it in. So I can just name the file in the middle of the sequence. Or I could take this, this X arrow X, which is just the Node.js system echo action, like yes, I could have woven that in to the middle of the sequence. Or whatever, as a silly example, if it was a package action, for example, I wanted to say, first do A, then project out that this one field in the response of A and pass that to C. Um, with the WSIP command line, I'd have to make a file for that, I'd have to name it. Um, and it doesn't really belong on its own. It's really part of the sequence. And so that's just a general flavor of what we're trying to shoot for um, with, with the shell. And um, so the last bit that I'll show you via video, um, what was mentioned briefly, I'll start the video up, is um, being able to get some simple visuals. So, so what I did here is I created um, a, an action. Um, the syntax is, is up for argument. If you have a better syntax than I propose, I'm totally open to it. The syntax that I, that I got, I aimed for here was basically no, a Node.js, as close to Node.js-like syntax as possible. In fact, this actually is Node.js syntax, but it's a shell command. So I said, make a new action called demo, and the action is just an actual action, so I'm going to it simple. And I executed that command, and with the WSK command line, you could just get back OK. You don't get back any details. If you want to see the details of what you just created, for example, what the default quota, are, quota is, um, and confirming that the source was communicated directly to the back end, you have to do a get. Um, and, uh, or you have to do a risk dash B um, to see the output. But in either case, the output you get back is JSON. You either have to pass the JQ um, or just parse in your head. And so this, the second main aspect beyond just having Sort of a better syntax and higher level commands is having some some simple but high impact visuals that you can very quickly and you can very quickly flip between those modes. Um, the Linux OpenRISC does have some graphical elements, but um, personally, I think people I've talked to, it's it's a big mode switch to be in the CLI and then go to the to the graphical console and have to log in again because um, you don't do that that often. It's a big mode switch. And so for something simple, you just want to look at just some, some simple renderings of the JSON output. And so the thought here is that I want to keep the graphics as simple as possible because graphics are expensive to write and maintain, but we need some graphical help because JSON is just a real bore to parse in the head. So on the right, I call it the sidecar. Um, it, it flew in from the, from the left there. If you saw it go back a little bit here after I created it. I hit return, the sidecar flies in, and I can see what I created. The next thing I do is I want to invoke it. Um, that, what I'm trying to do for this Hello World video is to give you a, just a simple sense, and I'll do a, do a more complicated example in just a few minutes, but a simple sense of this creation process of creating, um, validating what you created, uh, invoking, um, and then iterating, and, uh, and then crafting larger constructs from them. So you're building up from something small to something that you more complicated which you actually need. So the next thing I want to do is I want to invoke it. And uh, another big tedious aspect of using CLI is just how you, you're repeating yourself all the time. And that's why we, one of the reasons we invent shell scripts, all of us. And so in this case, um, I, I, I just created it. And demo, this little gray text here is signifying the current selection, which of course you can see on the right um, as well. And if I want to invoke it, the way that the shell has, all the shell commands have a notion of implicit entity context. If you, you can name the entity if you want. I could have said invoke foo, but if I don't name an entity, it'll use, if, if it exists, it'll use the current selection. So I can invoke it, and I didn't have to name demo, which is handy if you have a big complicated name. You end up doing a lot of copying and pasting with the WSK um, script because you, have, you want to use longer, meaningful names, but you don't want to type them in every time. And so in this case, 
I don't even need to worry about any of that. It's just, it's just the default implicit part of the context. So I built it. And again, I didn't have to parse any JSON in my head. I got the output on the right in terms of the execution time, in terms of the results, in terms of the timing information, in terms of um, billing in case that you're using um, something like Bluemix or whatever platform that actually imposes some, some charges. Um, then uh, just to show you that we can actually, it, we can actually use the WSK syntax if you want. And I could have created um, entities the same way. Um, so I can do a list activation list and I uh, get a list. In this case, I did it with two columns. Um, it's low major in this case. Um, so I get the list and now I can click or I can click on these entities. I didn't have to do any copy and pasting. I can click on the activation um, and it opens up the activation I'm just looking at. I could have clicked on one of these. Um, instead of having list activation list every time, the shell has a notion of synonyms or shorthand. So activation um, dollar, I just, that was a syntax, a, a shorthand that seemed to be meaningful to me. Those are the build elements. Um, so, and it's so common, I wanted a single letter abbreviation for it. So dollar is a shorthand for activation. And LS, maybe why we should just, since we have, maybe we can use a bit of a, the folder metaphor from, from the Unix world. And use some of its commands, and you can see you'll see with longer videos how ls and, um, and rm. A lot of these these commands already have you know at least for Unix people already have a, um, you know well understood um, syntax. So dollar ls is just a short answer for the with activation list. Again, I can click on one of these elements. The escape key, by the way, I'm using the toggle open and close as sidecar. So now I can, now I've created something that seems to work, and I want to compose it into something larger. Um, so in this case, I'm using the error, the single error notation to sequence together. Um, I'm making a stupid example here, but I'm just keeping it simple to start with. Um, and so I created a sequence. So now I use some simple visuals. Again, that's the order of the day. Simple but high impact visuals. I mean, that's a lot of value. I'm willing to invest the effort in visuals. Um, because you know, something, something like this helps quite a bit. So you see what I did here is I sequenced together an action I'd already created, demo, with an action that I, it's new, XAOX. It's a silly example again, but in general, that would be a scheme alignment. I have a longer video that I'll show you actually doing scheme alignment, path projection, and all that. I can invoke this the same way with add ID amendment. Um, I got my sequence back. The last thing I'll show you in this simple video is um, a big need for um, viewing activations for sequences. So sequences are really a tree of activations. And um, in ISO, we had some tree visualization of what went on. And so that's what the tree command does. Um, the command basically just visualizes the execution tree of that, uh, of that sequence. And it'll work for nested. So if it's nested more deeply down, also the tree view will show you that. So I'll create an example of that in a second. Just showing how we can go back in history in the shell and click on anything that was previous in the command history. So we can sort of just uh, explore the space pretty, pretty flexibly. Um, another, there's a lot of these shorthands I think we've all intended shell scripts for. Another common one is that whenever you start using sequences, um, you end up with a lot of activations. It's, and it'd be nice to be able to distinguish between the rootmost activations and all the low level detail. And that's what the WISC, the roots command does. The WISC activation roots will list just the rootmost activations. And since I, that personally is a super common, that's the most commonly used command for me. I invented a super duper shorthand for it. Um, we can, of course, argue about what the shorthand should be, but this is mine. So dollar dollar will list only the rootmost um, activations. You can see here, here the low-level details went away. I think I'm going to scroll up in a second to show that Anon, all the and demo, all those things went away for the sequence. And I can see this problem as well. Um, there's a, a notion of command context there. So, um, and that's one of the ways we can alleviate um, some of the commands. Um, so I just did a CD to change back to the home context, which is actions. I thought that would be a useful home context. Now I'm going to make a nested sequence. I'm going to sequence the other that sequence with something else, it's not a stupid echo action. 
I just wanted to show the nest of trees. Um, and then again, I invoke that without having to name it. And the tree view shows you know, how we can have a nested perspective. So that's the hello world one. Um, maybe some questions, or we can leave it here if you guys are all bored. But I also have a longer video showing something actual, something actually real, and not hello world. Um, but any thoughts, questions, feedback at this point? Or you can tell me to have heard enough. I have loads of questions um, and I have had a little play with this um, as you know because I had to ask for technical support. Um, yeah. I, I find it interesting that um, this exists. I think it's very nice for you know the kind of demo that you've done here um, and perhaps showing, showing off um, OpenWhisk to clients. I'm not sure how it fits in terms of like I don't deploy from my laptop, the continuous deployment system does the deployment. So it's cool for dev, but then how do I translate that into a, into a real application? Mm -hmm. It needs a pipeline behind it. Yeah, I wasn't sure how scriptable you felt um, it was. And also, is this something that we're like, yes, we all have shell scripts and thank you to so many of you to share sharing yours and I obviously I have my own little script collection as well um, I definitely agree with with a, with a lot of your original comments about um, the need for shell scripts I wonder if anyone definitely including you Nick but maybe everybody else um, has thoughts about working on an alternative tool rather than investing in the with command line which already exists mm -hmm. I, I've got I personally have mixed feelings about that and so I'd like to Kind of just have a bit of a discussion about that that side of things um, about moving away from kind of the scriptable open source tools that we have. Well, firstly, I think um, our hope is to open source this um, in the near future. We just have to clean up a few loose ends um, on our side. So um, I think it's not so much an open sourcing issue. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I have my own comments. If anybody else wants to chime in, I'd be happy to think. I have one quick comment, uh, and I see Lionel's on, so he may want to raise this, but I think one of the goals will be sort of duality. You can, whatever you develop in the WISC shell, uh, you can say export uh, deployment script, and it would give you essentially a scriptable shell-based, old-school CLI-based uh, script that then you can use as part of your continuous development and continuous integration testing, et cetera. Uh, sort of the idea is that you can program in a shell, that's sort of your development environment, but you can always sink down and bottom out into something that then you can deploy uh, as part of a CI. And Lionel, who I see is on, uh, has been working on this, so he, he could add comments if he likes. Yeah, in fact, if you look at the, some of the, these gallery commands, um, the, all of these, um, think if I have a, I think this one here, they, so on the left here, there's, you can see there's a sequence of shell commands. And this, these are sh shell commands, so I first created translate service using the Google translation service. Um, then I sequenced them together. I sequenced a request to the Google API with a path projection, with another service call, with another projection, with another map of, of this translation. So, and then I do another command. So this is a script. It's a script of, sh of WISC shell commands as opposed to a ship a script as you might like you might see on the left, which is a script either of Node.js code or of Bash shell. Um, so it's undeniable that we need to have some level of scripting because one there's not going to be one command, one shell command that just does everything. The goal of the shell is to is to take the meaningful high-level atomic tasks and make those one-liners so that you can have a simple script much simpler syntactically and much shorter that accomplishes your deployment tasks. And so you can actually take these, you can actually copy this to your clipboard and go over to the shell, this is actually a live shell, and paste it in. So the best step one, so the shell does understand multi-line paste. But then once we have the, um, once we have that capability, then making it so that you can execute the REPL outside of the context of the graphical elements is a pretty minor increment. It's, it's, 
in itself. It's on the to-do list. We just haven't gotten to it yet. But that's the hope here is that we we can't do everything through scripting totally, but the scripts that we that we write should be simple syntactically, and they should be they should they should accomplish the goals as lucidly and as quickly and as short in as short a fashion as possible, so that I'm not writing a lot of low-level scripts and I'm not writing on the right here. This is this is all the Node.js code you'd have to write to to deploy that asset. And this is actually just a subset of it. Um, there's there's a lot of examples like this where um, somebody wrote, I don't think he's on the call, but he actually wrote an autocomplete example. And he had to write like 50 or 60 lines of Node.js code, I'm just scrolling through here on the right, just to deploy his assets, because he had, because a lot, there's a lot of things that the, the, the underlying API doesn't support, so that requires some scripting on top. And so that's all stuff that instead of us time and time again writing scripts for that. We should not avoid scripts, but we should we should we should embody the common tasks into the record so that I'm I'm just doing things like I can do on the left. I can say I send that HTTP. That says I want a web exporter as with a, an HTTP protocol. I can say at to um, incorporate a file um, as a parameter. These are all things that, yes, we could augment the CLI for, the Go, current Go CLI for, um, and maybe want to contemplate that. What we wouldn't get are things like this. We wouldn't be able to write this, because this is not, the Go, the Go CLI would have, you know, it's a, it's a, run, it's a one and done thing. You would have to take command and be done. Yeah, I think, I think my reservations there are around, not that we don't need this functionality, but that, I'm not sure how useful this is for people who do need to deploy in a scriptable way, um, who don't want to learn a new shell, who don't write JavaScript. Um, we, we, you know, we, we do have OpenWhisk users of other languages. So mm -hmm. I, I, I think I, 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 lo I love it actually, and it looks nice, but I'm not, I'm not sure if in principle, we're making a, a tricky decision here where paving the cow path on the existing tool might also be valid, maybe in addition to this. Mm -hmm. my, my view on this is there's such a big tooling gap in serverless computing that you're going to have to slice uh, and close the gap many different ways. This is one such tool in that space. For the hardcore developers who just prefer writing their own bash scripting in CLI, you may never win them. For a majority of users who are actually trying to develop applications, doing it iteratively, this might appeal. Uh, especially with the integrated plugins for helping you visualize your application execution. That's not to say that there won't be investments that other vendors or platform providers or the open source community develops around some of that tooling. Uh, and then I think this is really uh, wide open in terms of figuring out how to close that tooling gap relative to where serverless is today. Yeah. The main thing I think is that we, we, I think we all agree that we need to have some way of um, extending the command set because the API is going to change very slowly relative to the needs um, of the things we discover we need at a higher level. Um, and so how do we do that? How do we add complicated support? For example, Roger was mentioning, mentioning project level management, export and import, um, debuggers, um, that's, these are all, these are all uh, uh, automatic schema inference. So there's a lot of things that we could do, we could do to make the development tasks simpler and better. Um, and we need some platform for that. And that's, those, those tasks, you know, that's, that's, that's the question. How do we, what is the right platform for that? And I, I personally think that that platform needs, can benefit generally from having visuals, um, so I'm not copying and pasting, I'm not clicking for you to do iterative development. And then scripted, which is super important as well, we can handle, I think, just by making the REPL separate from the, from the graphical elements. That's my perspective. All right. Thank you, Nick. Yep. Pretty, pretty cool tool.
Um, I'm, I'm seeing in the in, in the chat we have a couple of inquiries on on topics. So I will push my um, uh, assuming that that you are finished. Um, I will push my invoker stuff uh, somewhere somewhere else and uh, address what uh, people want to hear about. So um, Michael asked for the performance tests that I've uh, I've lined out. I don't know how long before, but uh, I have a personal, it's, they're still in my personal repository. And uh, you probably want to converge on, on some strategy that's the official way to test uh, OpenWhisk. Yes, and sorry to, to bug you about this in this call. Um, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that, that's what the call is for. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's sort of kind of a pet peeve that, that it would be great if we, if we discuss performance issues uh, of whatever kind that, it, that we sort of have a common test base that is open source and we sort of uh, all can run into whatever environment we seem uh, fit. And uh, I thought you had, you had a great start there. So I was wondering if, if something, if there's a consideration that would stop you from, um, from sort of moving it over to, to OpenWhisk or or whatever. I, I think with you mentioning uh, those as being able to be official, I think there's nothing, uh, <clears throat> there seems to be already people thinking that they are the official way. So we can, I think we can just, we could just move them over as a, at least a stake in the ground. Uh, I completely agree with you with the work I did uh, recently, like exchanging the invoker and working on load balancing. I wasn't really able to show the benefits like in numbers. Uh, so we totally should have those test harnesses. Uh, another, another issue on that, uh, on the same board is um, wh where do we run them? Uh, the ideal would be that we would have some machines out in the open and the Jenkins or whatever, uh, where everybody can look at, at the tests and even continuously run those tests mm -hmm. and uh, report on pull requests if they introduce regressions, that would be the ideal. Um, but I think we can take this incrementally by starting uh, to, uh, as you said, move the repository to official Apache. And uh, something I wanted to do for weeks and months now, which I should finally get to, is to as I said, put a stake in the ground, uh, publish a, one of those runs and say, they ran on uh, so many invokers, so many machines, these are the specs of the machines and that's my outcome. So at least people can, uh, you know, um, can see what, what we're looking at. Yeah, uh, click on this, we, we've seen, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I have uh, one question. I, I, I looked at the throughput uh, script uh, some time ago. Uh, I was just wondering, it looks like everything is, uh, uh, all the containers are from the uh, warm-up state. Uh, so I was wondering, uh, you know, if that is the true measure of the latency, meaning every time you assign a new container, uh, probably uh, it should start from a, a cold container. Otherwise, it, uh, you know, if you're running like 100 tests, it's kind of giving incorrect information when you look at the latency numbers, right? Uh, meaning, you know, the more actions that you run, the latency seems to be like shorter, which is uh, somewhat non-intuitive. So I was wondering in the performance, uh, can we have these kind of uh, um, configurations uh, like, you know, cold start, uh, warm, warm start or whatever. Yeah, I wanted to bring this up when we have the performance discussions, but and now that we are talking about it, I just wanted to comment on that. I think that's a great question. I think uh, also, uh, I think the way to frame it is potentially what are the benchmark suites that we should have and hence enumerating the set of things that we're potentially measuring. Uh, you know, there's raw latency, there's raw throughput, there's latency under different scenarios. And uh, one way of doing this is to actually talk about uh, not just the methodology of here's how you write your benchmark and then run it and having the infrastructure and Apache to back it. But also it's, you know, I think there needs to be a set of benchmarks that we also standardize on and saying, here's a serverless benchmark suite. It measures the following different dimensions. Um, and with, without that, then I think, you know, your, your point is very valid. You know, people will be measuring different things. And if, you know, in the Slack channel last week or so, we've seen a number of different, uh, developers 
trying to do this kind of benchmarking themselves and asking, how do I change this? How do I change that? And reporting their numbers and working through some of the issues there. So having a consistent way of saying, here's the benchmarking uh, testbed. Uh, here's the methodology. You execute it automatically reporting even uh, and curing all those numbers might be a nice thing. Um, it's going to require some effort if the first step is to just take what Marcus has done and put it under Apache. Uh, it gets us a step closer. We should do it. I think we need to do it, though, in conjunction with figuring out and somebody taking a lead on figuring out how to get infrastructure out of Apache to also do systematic testing. Yeah, I can um, quickly comment on what you just said, Roderick and Marcus. So uh, when, when that came up the first time of having a, an Apache way of running tests in the open, I, I reached out to, um, to Infra. Um, I, I think that just went into a black hole. I never, never got any reply. Talking to the Apache people I know, I, I never got any useful information of, of other projects doing something similar. So I'm, I'm kind of a bit of a loss at a loss how to drive that forward. Um, so I really think it shouldn't, shouldn't hopefully stop us to move the scripts into Apache in the first place. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure by when we, we would get to a resolution of running the scripts in the open. Do you know if that's something our mentors can help with? Uh, you know, is that something we can get guidance from them on or lean on them for support? Um, I think I asked Felix. Um, I can ask again. Uh, I actually pinged the mentors in, in that thread that we had a couple of uh, weeks back, and they, they didn't reply. I, see. I suspect it's not a simple question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, to, 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 to skip that part... Uh, I, I wanted to come up with at least uh, what I just what I said before uh, a run. Then maybe it's not openly available, but at least it's specified, uh, and uh, we tell people on which hardware it runs. Uh, so it's at least a start. We're not blocked too long uh, on this. Um, one thing um, which is from my point of view crucial to uh, our, uh, an aligned and standardized strategy though is uh, agreeing on some framework. Um, I started looking in, uh, and, and Tyson as well started looking into Gatling, uh, which has its benefits, which also, also has its drawbacks. Um, I think mm. you guys were looking into, what is it? Uh, can, can I, Tyson, what's the, what's, the, what's the framework you were looking at late, lately? Uh, Locust. Ah, right, Locust. Um, which also has drawbacks. So, so I mean, I could quickly give a, a quick summary there. So if, if anybody is looking for, like, running tests that have a broader variety than the bash scripts that use the, the Node.js Node uh, load test system, uh, Gatling is a, um, a, a Scala based load testing tool that's kind of like a, a Scala DSL around something similar to JMeter. So you can, uh, you can script out um, quite a variety of more sophisticated tests that mix different types of loads instead of a specific URL where the load doesn't really change. Um, so someone was asking about that. You may want to look at the, the um, PR for, that I have out for, the, for Gatling and Marcus's repo. Um, for... For Gatling, I think you know, you know, my my take is that it's, um, you know, it, it can produce a really good variety of load, but the reporting is is fairly terrible. Um, so if you if you wait long enough, you will get the summary report, and in the meantime, you'll get tons of noise. Um, and then Locus is kind of the opposite, where the um, the scriptability of it and the ability to to easily create um, tests um, is um, more limited, but the reporting is much better. And it and it we've been we've been looking at Locus recently more for being able to generate a, a load across the distributed system with you know thousands of of, of users, um, which Gatling will only work in a distributed fashion with their uh, their pay for version. So I, I don't know. We haven't found the perfect solution. I think, I think Gatling is a reasonable compromise. Um, uh, I think Locus also has some, um, kind of, uh, 
um, issues with getting out of sync with the, the servers that are running as far as the reporting UI goes. Um, but the, uh, yeah, so the, basically we haven't found a, an obvious um, choice, but they all have their problems. Yeah. I would also add, this is Dragos here, Tyson, to your comment that uh, I have some experience with another tool which is called Tsung, G-S-U-N-G, which is written in Erlang. Um, but I, um, so that, that is working very fast. I was able to test with millions of uh, concurrent requests per second, but it's, it's, it's quite difficult to cluster, to run Erlang in a cluster. Um, in my opinion, with experiencing like some load testing tool, I find Locus uh, would be my top choice just because it runs distributed and it's easier to run in a cluster. Yeah, so that's uh, at least two voices for Locust. Um, I think I, I look into it as well. Um, my main concern was uh, I actually found the Gatling reporting quite good. At least the report that falls out at the end, the HTML-based reporting was, was uh, nice to look at at least. Um, the only thing I want to make sure is that the reporting reports everything we need. Like if you start to inject user load in the middle, it, that, that you can see how it impacts other users. That's, that's the only thing I want to get out of, uh, out of those because the load tests we have now, obviously, they basically report one number, which is throughput or latency. And uh, yeah, we, we need a bit more. Um, we need to be able to look into it a, a bit deeper. That, that is interesting. I mean, uh, Gatling does give you better time-based views than either the current load tests or Locust only gives you kind of uh, a summary aggregate as well. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> they're, all, they're all terrible. <laughs> okay, so we need to find the, the, least, uh, the, the least horror. Yeah, I would take a look at Locust and and see what you think. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, but well, other than that, if I it's think easier, we can even do a screen sharing video and share it with the community if you think it's easier than having you learning how to run it. Just let us know. Okay, thanks. This is is there then uh, so one. One outcome is we need to move the repository to Apache. Uh, I guess Marcus could just do that. And then, uh, you know, if we're going to change from one framework to another, then that can just be done with pull requests. Yeah. And, uh, you know, really, I think, um, you know, this may be the type of thing that uh, one, one size will not fit all from, you know, from their deployment point of view. Um, so um, I, I, I would almost think it would be useful to have any, you know, anything that people experiment with, just just add it to the repo, and and we can. There's no reason we can't have like a variety of different types of tests um, makes sense to imp me. implemented with a variety of different frameworks. And ideally, we, you know, we can produce reports from all of them. And um, however, I think just getting one of them to run on a regular basis will be another kind of hurdle. Um, that we don't have a good answer for right now. Yeah, I agree. I think as long as we standardize on here's the end things that every one of these frameworks should measure, and so you should have basically a benchmarking suite, uh, then you want to implement it in Gatling or something else, up to you. Uh, yeah. but at least when you're reporting performance, here are the things you should be reporting. Right. Yep, makes sense. Over time, this might then even converge to something we agree on. If we experiment with different ways. Okay, so uh, I, I get it uh, moved to the Apache organization, and then uh, you can take it from there. I will merge your Gatling pull request probably. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, let's see. Let's let's see where we get. I, I guess for um, yeah, in terms of uh, writing writing benchmarks, I guess the dev list uh, and all pull requests will be sufficient for now. I mean, uh, as, as it was already pointed out, we are only measuring pretty basic stuff currently. So 
really everything that you measure on top of that helps. So uh, there's no reason to be hesitant right now. Okay. Um, got like five minutes or like 10 minutes left. Um, want to talk about the authentication issue from yesterday? Sure. Roger, you want to? Uh, I think Drago should volunteer. Is Drago even around? Anyway. I'm sorry, I, I lost oh, you for oh, yeah. I lost you a, a little bit. Uh, so what was the question? Oh, maybe, sorry, I'm looking in the chat. It was Tyson. He said, I'd like to chime in on authentication issues. Oh, yeah, sure. So, so Dragos, we're, we were just going to talk about the authentication uh, discussion that we had in Slack uh, yesterday. Um, so I think, you know, the, the basic issue is um, providing a, uh, a different set of or a way to extend the authentication workflow that uh, the WIS command line client uses. And um, I, I kind of view it as a, as a couple of different changes. Um, and I know, uh, I think Roderick, you pointed out the, um, the, uh, the cert authentication PR that's um, pending. Um, and you know, it's, it, I think there's similar requirements for making it extensible, but that basic, basically there would have to be some changes to the, uh, CLI so that the authentication headers <coughs> that, um, uh, the CLI uses are based on the deployment, um, configuration. And you could either uh, explicitly set those using a different um, um, uh, parameter for the CLI. So instead of just having whisk off, um, have uh, whisk dash dash basic off or whisk dash dash bearer off or um, however, however the arguments are formatted. I, I don't have a strong preference for that. Um, so that the, the CLI could explicitly choose which authentication um, header gets added to the HTTP request. Um, so changing the WISC CLI would be one aspect of it. And then at the server side, um, making the authentication implementation uh, pluggable so that, um, you know, for example, I think in the, um, in the PR for cert authentication, the way that it was added is that it checks for, uh, it, it still tries to check for basic authentication. And um, if that fails, it will also validate a cert. Um, but instead of doing that, what I would want to do is have an explicit configuration that says, this deployment supports basic authentication or this deployment supports uh, JWT authentication. And for those, uh, specific implementations, there would probably be some, you know, implementation specific configuration. So, you know, where are the endpoints, uh, or what's the approach that I'm going to use to validate the JWT, um, or the cert or whatever is embedded in the request. Um, so that's, I mean, I think that's it in general. And then, uh, separately from that, you know, we kind of also kind of added on, a. a, a, a a, another topic, which is instead of m implying that you need to use, um, you know, specify the auth parameter in every WISC call um, or call WISC set property to set up your um, WISC props, that uh, it could be simplified a little bit using a, a login command, um, which would also be based on how the deployment was configured. So if you call WISC login with, um, you know, it's using a token, you would be prompted for a URL that would actually help you generate the token. Um, so is that a good enough summary, Dragos? That's all good, Tyson, yeah. I tried yesterday to capture these in a, on a dev list, 
Well, hopefully I did a reasonable job of capturing your thoughts there. Yeah, I think so. Um, I think, you know, the, the, uh, yeah, the, the main issues that I would want to look at, you know, first would be the CLI changes and the, um, making the authentication pluggable, um, at the, at the server side. Um, I don't know if folks have other opinions on how the, um, the off arguments in the CLI behave and whether this kind of, kind of changes if they have some other ideas on that. Yeah. You could, you could imagine, uh, can you, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you can imagine also ju just using the dash off and, uh, the CLI somehow figures out in conjunction with the backend what it should, how it should send its stuff. That could be a simplification, but I think it doesn't really change the approach, which I think is the right one. So I, I think uh, having JWT based tokens or something in the controller uh, is fairly, fairly easy to do. Uh, as you said, we just need it to be pluggable. And uh, as you also said, it shouldn't be check this and this and this and it should just be uh, check the one you were configured with and that's it so yeah i think the challenges will be around how do you integrate with the subject database how do you integrate with with all that stuff but in general i think uh, it's a valid approach so one of the the uh, links i provided on the dev list was uh, i think more or less a prototype of this that nick mitchell did uh, I think he did with login, and then he has a proof of concept for both GitHub and Google. Um, so you, so you, you do with login GitHub as an OAuth provider. It actually opens your browser, takes you through the OAuth flow, and then updates the subject database so that then you can use that token for subsequent CLI commands. And that could be a good starting point for exploring this further. Uh, it does the CLI changes and modifies the, uh, uh, the, the database and insert subjects. Um, I think the changing the auth behavior, the thing we'll need to be cognizant of is backwards compatibility and not breaking people's scripts um, for, for existing CLI users. So we may need a different dash dash auth token uh, uh, command line argument, for example. Yeah, yeah, I think. Um uh, yeah, this is interesting. I haven't had a chance to look at uh, at his uh, pull request, um, but it's, it's it's not a pull request. Oh, it's a branch. Sorry, it's just it's a branch. Yeah, it's a branch. He played. With, I mean, Nick, you can talk about it. I guess I shouldn't have to. Yeah, this was about I think about six eight months ago. So it's stale in terms. Of, I'm sure the CLI has changed quite a bit. It's no longer in the repo anymore, um, but. The basic structure was there was a CLI change to add WISC, login, and then you gave the provider, GitHub or Google, those are the two I added support for. Um, and then on the back end, I added a container um, that, uh, that, and the controller would pass certain requests, this login request to the container, which would then do all the work of, of acquiring a subject and adding an auth key and all that, and then it would hand back um, a key, the log, login <clears throat> output of that request would be the auth key. So it was working and actually I wrote tests. There were tests back in tests against the CLI, which took a little bit of work, um, but uh, it, not quite complete. So, and it's of course stale. So I would leave, I would leave it to your judgment as to whether it's, you know, whether it's a start, good starting point or not from a code perspective, but at least from a, from a proof of concept perspective, hopefully it's of, of some value. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's that's helpful. Alrighty. Um, do we have any steps to take from that, or is it just general agreement that we that if this is doable, and uh, somebody will look into it? Uh, I think that last one. Uh, um, you know, I think I think we agree it's doable, and. Um, I think uh, if anybody um, gets time sooner than later to look at this at the uh, branch of um, 
sorry, uh, uh, Nick's um, would be a good source of inspiration at least and um, should uh, advertise on the dev list if they start to look at it so that nobody starts uh, duplicating. Alrighty. Great, we're on top of the hour. Um, one inquiry, who wants to moderate the next one in, in two weeks' time? Somebody not from IBM, maybe? Tyson, I still got your face on my screen, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, sure. Uh, this is uh, Wednesday. In two uh, weeks. Yeah, two weeks. I'm just double checking my calendar. Yeah, I think that should be fine. Alrighty, then I, I uh, take you at least. Uh, yeah, it will be the next one. Sure. All right. Thank you, uh, everybody, for joining. Can I ask for some help setting up a uh, Zoom uh, meeting? Sure. I, I hope that Matt will be will be back. I think we, if he if he's on, we can always use uh, his room. I think. Yeah. Okay. We'll talk in the meantime. Yeah. Yep. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good Thank one. Thank you. Thank you.